All righty, let's see. We just turned on the recording, and we'll be recording everything. This is uh, pretty much just an introductory, and the fact that I'm getting over a chess code of, you know, if suddenly I go quiet or if the screen goes quiet, it's because I've turned the mic off so I can go into a coughing fit. But we'll, we'll be fine. We'll get through it just fine. What I want to do tonight is basically just walk you through um, the class, how it works. Uh, there's one of the things that I get from a lot of my students is their initial reaction to taking a course that is project-based learning based is they get a little uh, overwhelmed by the number of projects that are in here. And I just want to assure everybody that the whole idea of this class is to give a general survey of the issues and the opportunities that are involved with integrating technology into education. I'm going to go shut a door and I'll be right back. This class has grown from a class that was very much heavily uh, invested in investigating uh, things like ISTE standards and the theoretical basis for technology use and education. And after a few years of doing that, I, I really began to realize that what, what folks are really looking for are things that they can apply and use in their classrooms. So everything that we play with in here, all the applications that we use are readily available to you either through a um, login that I easily share with you or creating your own setup. Uh, I try to stay away from things that cost anything. And if they do cost something, then I bear the cost and let you use it for free. So let's look through the course real fast. If you look over here on the left-hand side as I'm starting, this is where everything lives. This is called the, la the landing pad in Blackboard jargon. And that's what this little uh, wonderful picture is all about. But this is what I really want to, you to see. You'll see here that it has this thing, read this first, taking an online class. You'll notice down here the last sentence says, I freely give you my text number, 502-457-2937. Use it. And I really, really do mean that. Um, we are in a situation where you are in what I call the great beyond. Uh, and so to, for you to be able to reach to me uh, through email is a fairly cumbersome process, even though we think of email as the way that we all now communicate. I find that using a messaging app, of course I have a, I use iMessage, is, gives me a much greater ability to get back to you because we all want immediate answers. We don't want to have to sit around and wait for your email to be discovered among all the hundreds that come in every day. So I really, really want to stress to you, and no question is too trivial. I want to stress to you to use that text number. Now the only thing I'll ask you to do is in that first text that you send me, uh, if you just put your name in it. And that way I can then create a contact. So when you send me the next text, your name will come up and then I'll know that it's somebody from this class. So please do not hate to use that. We're gonna go through these in just a second. These are the modules that make up the course. This is how, of course, you get into the course. Uh, let me show you a couple of things there. The way I work is that there is a place here for recordings, and we will have recordings, and they will be here available to you. And you go in here and you click on recordings and you'll see them all. But the way I like to do it, oops, sorry. The way I like to do it is I do that but then I also upload the recordings into YouTube. And then I send out an announcement, just like I did for class tonight. And then in that announcement will be the link that will take you to the YouTube one. Now, why do I do this sort of double work? It's really simple. The Collaborate Ultra does a nice job of doing a 
screencasts, which is something we're going to talk about in our class. Does a nice job of doing screencasting. But I find that the quality of it through the Blackboard is demoted. It just doesn't come through as nice. When I take that original recording, that MP4 file, and I put it into YouTube, YouTube does its magic to it and really brings up the, the standard, the quality of it. I also hear from students that they like to have their phone sitting next to them, running the video in YouTube, and then doing on the screen what needs to be done for class. So you'll have two ways of getting to what we record in class. There'll be a link here. Uh, it's not here right now because we don't have any recordings yet, but I'll create a link here that'll say EDAP 585 recordings, and that'll be all the recordings that are made inside a Blackboard Collaborate. But I will also send you after every class the following day. So like today's work will be probably ready for me to send to you tonight. Um, future classes that will probably run a lot longer than this class is going to today. That uh, much bigger file, video files are huge. Uh, that point of probably will have to be the following. In other words, I have to let it cook for a while. Uh, inside of Collaborate Ultra and then I can post it up to YouTube that takes a while and then once that all gets done then I can send it out so let's go through the oh and here's your syllabus link everything that's in the syllabus and everything that's in the modules are and everything that's in the assignments are all tied together there's there's no daylight in other words if it says something in the module that's what it means because it's just as simple as me copying it over and pasting it into the assignments. We're going to be using a lot of tools. And as I keep saying, those tools are readily available to you to use. And I will give you free access to them. What I want you to look at as you're using these tools is to make decisions about how they would work in your classroom. So the first thing we're going to do that I'll be asking you to do before next week is for you to come in here to this little blank space that's right here and go down and either click on the plus sign down here or you can do a double click into the cork space that's what it looks like and then this little thing pops up this is called a padlet and if you think of a Padlet as a cork board, as a bulletin board, as a parking lot, and I don't know if you've how many PD sessions you've ever been in in your schools, but usually after the PD, if it's a multi-day PD, we always put up something called a parking lot where you could ask the questions you wanted to ask in the session or you were afraid to or we ran out of time, whatever. This Padlet allows you to do this. Now, as you can see, this Padlet is here uh, in our Blackboard space in real time. In other words, we don't have to go somewhere else to use this Padlet. We just double click on it or click on the plus sign and the ability to add something here comes up. You can put Padlets into things like Google Classroom. We'll show you how to do that so that you have a way for kids to have a space to post those kind of questions that they may have that they're either afraid to ask in class or they thought of later after you've finished covering material. Uh, I've seen teachers use Padlets as a way of doing exit notes to come out of the class. In other words, they'll put the Padlet up on the screen in the classroom, and then they just literally watch as the notes pop in where kids are responding to, so what did you learn today in class? Um, it's, it has a quite a um, varied use, and you'll see that we use it a lot in here. We'll use it for our gallery walks when we talk about our book that we're going to be reading. And I really like it. So for this one, this is just a fun one. You go in, you're basically going to introduce yourself with a picture or a video and then describe technology use in the classroom with examples or pictures. So in other words, I could come in here and just put Steve Swan. And then, sorry, my, my keyboard is really, I'm going to have to replace this keyboard. Then I'm going to write something about myself. Okay. Now, if you look down here, what really gets interesting about Padlets is, as you can see, you've got an upload button right here. So the Padlet could be a place where kids can upload something that they have created. 
uh, AKA digital backpack. They can put a link in here. So in other words, if they know a website that they really like going to, uh, and they can put that link in there. In other words, they can have multiple ways of demonstrating their understanding of class. Then there's the Google. So you can have a full-blown Google search right here. And then, of course, here is where you can take a picture of yourself. So if I come up here and click on this one, it's going to start launching Photo Booth, and I'll say Allow. And as you can see, the camera that I've got set up here in our classroom, I'm going to have to turn it around so you can see me. And there I am. So let's see. Let's tilt it down a little bit. There we go. So if I want to include my face, which is kind of scary, into my Padlet, I just turn it around, smile, click the picture. How many times have you had that happen? Um, Look at this. You can do grayscale and sepia. That's kind of scary. So I'm going to go ahead and say normal. And I'm going to save it. So what it does then is it will put my picture in. Well, I moved my head. <laughs> so we'll probably take that one out and take it again. If you don't like what you've created and if it's a mistake or whatever, you just go up here and do the trash can and get rid of it. So these are, these are padlets. Uh, we like Padlets a lot because of the ease. It's very simple to set up. And then the, the thing that you'll we'll read about, and this is something that our author that we're going to be reading really stresses, that technology should not be complicated. Uh, I always had a standing rule when I was uh, working in Jefferson County Public Schools as the instructional technology specialist. In my PDs, I would say to my teachers, you don't want to spend time teaching a technology. If it takes you longer than 15 minutes to show kids how to use a technology, it's not worth using. Now, if you're teaching a technology class, sure. You know, if you're teaching Photoshop, you're teaching Word, Excel, PowerPoint, sure. But all the other stuff, it should be just simple. And Fullen has a term for that that we'll be learning about. So as you can see, I try to put in the recordings of class actually in the modules as well. So as you can see, this was from last year, last semester. So um, I'll, I'll leave them in here because they're dated to give you as much feedback as you need to understand what we're doing in the class. So our first real module will be exactly what I was just talking about. And that is looking at this book called Stratosphere by Michael Fullen. Dr. Fullen is a, I guess you could say he's a world renowned. He certainly is internationally renowned. He is a Grandmeier Award here from the University of Louisville. His picture's hanging up in the hallway outside. Uh, I actually know Dr. Fullen. He was um, the dean of the College of the University of Toronto, their College of Education, when I was doing some work there um, in my job with Jefferson County Public Schools. He's a heck of a great guy. His book is very small. This is a very simple read. And, you know, everybody has the same questions about why do you make me read this text for this class? It's going to cost me money. Well, first of all, it's not going to cost you a lot of money. Um, you know, go on to Amazon. It's readily available there. Uh, get a used copy. It's just not expensive. Second of all, this is a book that if you are really thinking about um, being a change agent in your building for technology use, you really need to read. Because what Dr. Fullen does is he gives you this marvelous uh, full picture of what are the issues when we talk about technology use in schools. Uh, he has a great deal of hands-on expertise. As I said, he's internationally renowned. His thing, I guess if you have to have, you know, if you're a researcher, you have a thing. I, th I don't think of Fullen so much as a researcher, as much as a practitioner. I don't know how you would feel about that, but I always found him so refreshing because everything he talks about, he preaches about, he does it through the lens of working in schools. So his thing is something called change knowledge. How do we bring about change knowledge in school? How do we bring about 
change in school. And in this book, um, he's specifically speaking about how does technology change school. Um, and he does a really, really nice job. One of the things that he is, he's an inveterate name dropper. You know, he's that classic guy who, when you read, he says, uh, well, so-and-so, you in uh, 2010 wrote this, uh, so-and-so um, says that she thinks that this is the best way to look at this problem. He is an inveterate name dropper. And so one of the things I've tried to do in this first uh, module is to give you those people, to actually put a face and a voice to them that he uses in his book. And that's what we've got here. Um, he has, he talks about a lady by the name of Maggie Jet. Here she is. Here's Maggie. I actually know Maggie too. This one is fascinating. Look at the date on that. This is Marshall McLuhan. Marshall McLuhan was a preeminent um, professor of culture in English at the University of Toronto. Um, and he, in the late 60s, 70s, he was a part of that whole cultural revolution, hippiness, if you want to call it, in Toronto, um, like Haight-Ashbury in San Francisco. In Toronto, it took place on something called Bloor Street. Bloor Street is actually where, um, it's a street that runs east to west in Toronto, and at one end of it is the university. The university runs down a street called College, and it just runs for block after block after block after block. It's, it's an enormous place um, and ends up in Queen's Park, uh, which is where the parliament meets for the uh, Ontario uh, government. Toronto is the seat of power for Ontario. But McLuhan was in 1967 talking about the impact of technology on education. Just let that sit in your brain for a second. 1967. I, I just, it just boggles my mind. His classroom, <laughs> his classroom is a shrine. Um, you can go and, and stand and look at it. It's all locked. You can't get, well, you can get into it you know, on special occasion. But you look into it, and it's like this amazing snapshot of culture from the late 60s, early 70s in there, all the posters and, you know, all the, the when you think about, um, you all are probably young enough that your parents were probably a part of that. But when you think about all the things about what we, quote, quote call hippiness, um, it's all there in his classroom, but he's just an amazing, uh, writer and he's an amazing writer and a punster, which is something you see a lot with, um, people who write a lot about culture. And I'm sorry, we have a train going by outside right now. And that's the noise you're hearing in the background. I meant to close the window here in the classroom. This next guy. I would say that if we have a central character in these first two or three chapters that we'll be reading in Fullen, it's this guy right here. And I maintain that this little video should be watched by every single school that wants to start with a conversation about how are we using technology in our schools? How are we developing good practice around using technology in our school, trying to be proactive. This guy gives you the bad news, which we already know. Do you, when you put your phone down, become anxious when you walk away from it? Do you have an ongoing battle with students in your classrooms about phone use? I mean, Larry is a researcher. He's not an educator. He's a researcher. And what Dr. Rosen does is he backs up everything he says with solid research. It's an excellent, excellent video. And like I said, it's just a quickie. It doesn't last very long. This is Mark Prinsky. You now, Mark Prinsky kind of blew up on the scene of instructional technology when he created two terms. One was called digital native and the other was called digital immigrants. And I think there's enough distance now between, between Prinsky's writings that we can kind of go, yeah, yeah, we get it. Um, 
and that's not to dismiss what he what his work he's done. He actually has a really good book out there um, that I used to use with this class, but I found that it was it was limiting, um, and I quit using it. But he still has interesting things to say. Although it's the same, it's the stuff now we've been involved in technology. What seriously involved in in schools for twenty five some odd years. What are we seeing that's so different from when Prinsky was going around saying, well, we've got these digital natives who grew up with all this technology. By the way, it's the same thing that the ISTE people, the International Society for Teaching of uh, Technology and Education, what they say too, which is that the digital native, Prinsky's term, are people who grew up with technology and they understand natively. I have problems with that, frankly. And, you know, and, and everybody trots out the same thing. They trot out the little two or three year old kid sitting in front of an iPad or an iPhone and playing with it. What's the key word there? Playing with it. We'll come back to that over and over and over again. I don't think kids are wired differently. I think we are wired differently because of the impact of the visual culture that we have been inundated with since well, since television. But I don't think that children are all that different natively. They just do not have fear. And they're willing to sit there and touch and poke. And I mean, I, I have the great uh, delight of having a great nephew who stays with us during the day. Um, my wife has the great delight. She gets to stay home with him. But when we first put the iPad in front of him and started showing him things to play with, baby shark, all that sort of stuff, he just was sitting there just having a ball. But did he get to a frustration level? Sure he did. Sure he did. He's not wired in to understand it natively. But when he hit his frustration level, what he was able to do was he was able to look around and say, help in all the different ways that a two-year-old can say that. And having the wonderful great aunt that he has, you know, who is also a teacher, he would just keep right on going. Here's another guy uh, with a phrase. This is Don Pat Scott. His was the net generation. Uh, he's also the guy that came up with millennials. You know, you can... You can roll your eyes and go, okay, boomer anytime you want here. Um, I'm not I'm not putting him down. I'm just saying that that's his sort of thing. He's the guy who came up with this whole idea that everybody has grown up on the internet, et cetera, et cetera. Do we dis, do we do I disagree with that? No, I don't disagree with it at all. I think we are getting to the post net generation where we have we are starting to look back and realize how much we've given away in terms of our being an anonymous in terms of our personal information. And a lot of it is, I think a lot of us carry around anger because that has been done without our permission in a lot of ways. Uh, I've, I've formally left Facebook five years ago for that very reason. Um, I'm still, you know, a Twitter, um, and I still subscribe and, and still look at all my tweets and everything, but I've become much more careful about who I am uh, following. I found it really funny. There is a woman who is also a Grand Meyer Award winner here at the University of Louisville. Her name is Diane Ravage. And Diane is one of these firebrands who is a, which, which we all, we Lord mercy, we need them now in education more than ever, um, who is a firebrand for education um, reform, etc. And so it was natural then for me to start following her on Twitter. Well, I don't know if you know how Twitter works. I'm sure you do. But people who follow you can also follow or can see the people who follow them, uh, if you so choose, which, of course, I did because I thought, you know, Diane would have this very vast audience of, of people who wrote and think about education reform. Well, um, she had a guy that followed her who wrote the soft porn Internet books. And so his tweets that he would put out there would be basically advertisements for his books with little um, 
you know, chapters and passages that you could read. And then there was links that would take you to where you could, where you could buy the books. Uh, and that's the kind of stuff that we have stumbled through the last 10 years with this incredible creation that we've made. Which takes us to a guy by the name of Clay Shirky. Boy, if there isn't a voice that we should be listening to more than it is Clay Shirky. Uh, Clay's been around a while. And his phrase, his claim to fame is something called cognitive surplus. And basically what he's talking about is, what do we do with all this stuff? What do we do with all this stuff? How do we manage this enormous, you know, in the beginnings of the internet, we all ran around going, oh my goodness, the world is now connected. Isn't it a marvelous thing? Now we run around going, oh my God, the world is connected. What have we done? Shirky has some really interesting insights on that. Play, passion, and purpose. Yeah, as I said, we'll keep coming back to this idea of play. It is extremely important for us to understand as teachers that for us to understand how to reuse technology in our classrooms, we have to have an opportunity to play with technology in safe spaces. When I say a safe space, I don't mean like somebody's going to, you know, get up and hit you in the head. I mean, it's a place where you can have the time, <coughs> excuse me, to look at it and think about how it fits into your classroom. As opposed to having a room full of people and suddenly trying to use something for the first time. And there, here's our Padlet that we'll be using for that. Okay, and as you can see, what we do here is we create something called an infographic. You know what infographics are. So what you're going to be doing is you're going to be creating an infographic using a tool called Pictochart. This is a really, really powerful tool. And so we'll be creating an infographic about chapters 2 and 3 and an infographic about chapters 4 and 5. We kind of call the chapters two and three the doom and gloom of, or pedagogies for change. In other words, are we looking at it as doom and gloom? Oh, my God. How are we ever going to deal with all this technology with kids with phones, with kids with laptops? Here's, here's really the change that's happened. As I say, we've had technology around in schools now for like 20 years. But here's where the convergence has happened. We have gone from this being... Um, Except like this room I'm sitting in right now that I'm looking out at and there's 30 some odd computers sitting in here. The lab. Well, actually before the lab was what we called the cow, which was a computer on wheels, which was in the old days an Apple IIe that we would roll around in the classroom <coughs> that kids would load programs in um, on floppy disks that truly were floppy disks. And it was, you know, shared. It was a workstation, whatever. And then Apple came along and figured out how to network all that. Then we had these separate rooms, like I'm sitting in right now. What's so dramatically changing now is the one-to-ones. And you see it in these big rollouts. Here in Jefferson County, we have a one-to-one -one where we're giving every kid in the building an iPad that is furnished and the, the data the data is being paid for by Verizon so on and so on but really really where I think the change is coming is through the use of Chromebooks because the Chromebook is a much simpler and much cheaper appliance than something that's you know unique like an iPad and it can have the same kind of administrative overhead that um, iPads and other computers on networks can have. But the difference is every kid can have one in every class. And then if you put a piece in place like the classroom, the Google Classroom, now you have a complete synergy of using technology. And then what happens is the teacher has the power to be able to have kids create using multiple ways. And we're going to talk about that as well. So as you can see here, that's what two and three is about. Uh, and there he is. 
There's Mike. There's Dr. Fullen. Um, this is this little video is hilarious because, like I said, I've spent many, many, many summers up there. Um, he's standing in front of a building that if you walk down this alley, it's behind him. It goes out onto a street and across the street from that is a lovely little pub called the Prince Albert Pub. And I've sat in that pub with Dr. Fullen and lots of other folks around. They have an outdoor, you know, uh, area. And we'd sit around tables and just talking, talking about the possibilities and the challenges of using this marvelous, marvelous tool. In the chapters four and five, we really get into what Dr. Fullen talks about is change knowledge. We get into a gentleman by the name of Phil Schlechty, who is a Louisville product, by the way. He lives here. Um, and then what Schlechty wants to talk about is engagement. And what we are trying to get at in four and five, and this is really, I think, the, the where the book really comes through, is Fullen talks about how we can roll this technology into our classrooms so that it becomes invisible, so that it becomes ubiquitously efficient. In other words, we just walk in and we say, today we're going to create uh, something. Um, you know what to use. Uh, I'll expect it to be a collaborative project, so let's get that set up. You know, once, we, once kids learn how easy it is to share and collaborate within the Google suite of, of tools, then what the teacher basically is doing is just saying, use the tools that you know how to use and create. We spend less time on the process that allows us to have more time on the form. And this is another guy he talked about. Uh, this is John Hattie. <laughs> John Hattie. John Hattie is one of these researchers. Let me let you know inside of the world of research. People who do research, one of the things that they point to is the number of subjects, participants of their research. And there's this sort of step that when you reach it, your research has some weight, has some merit. I mean, you can do research on five, five people, research on five kids. You can do research on, you know, classroom. Teachers do it all the time. We call it action research. You don't know you're doing it, but you are. In other words, you're walking around, you're going, well, that went over like a lead balloon. What can we try next? You know, that's research, folks. So when scholars talk about their research, this guy, this guy can stand up and say, I have over three quarters of a trillion Let's do that again. I, a billion, I mean. I have three quarters of a billion with a T subjects that we have done research with. So when he stands up and says, here's what we're finding about when we try to apply change, you got to listen to him. And he has some good news about change occurring. <laughs> And the reason why we're doing all this is because one of the missions here at the University of Louisville College of Education and Human Development is this little wonderful graphic. And that is, don't kid yourself that I'm not trying to turn you into agents for change. But what I'm trying to do is to equip you to be an agent for change. In other words, when you go into your schools and you start talking about this stuff, I can't tell you how many times I've been into schools where we have done um, book studies using this book that you're going to read. It's a great way to get people to start thinking and talking about it. Um, just putting up Larry Rosen's video will open up all kinds of discussions. And you'll hear from the people who want to live in the caves. You know what I mean? and the people who don't want to live in the caves. So what we try to do here is we try to give you some strong basis of understanding of the whys of things. That's inquiry. The action of things are the what's in the hows. And that's where we play with, we play, here's that word again, we play with these various tools that we'll have in this course. 
and then advocacy. Trying to get you to think about yourself as a change agent in your building. Whether that might be, well, we've already got Google Classroom in our building, Steve. We're already a one-to-one. -one. We got kids with uh, Chromebooks all over the place. Fine. Remember what I said, that's form. I'm interested in process. How do I take that Google Classroom and open it up so that kids can do more with it other than just a turn in, other than just seeing stuff, actually doing demonstrations of understanding? Wow, that was just module one. Here's the lift for the course. This is TPAC, Tim, and UDL. I call it the alphabet soup. These are the research-based foundations upon which we can talk about technology integration. And I'm not going to get into this because I could talk for hours on this. But just let me give you a sense. TPAC stands for, they're all acronyms. TPAC stands for Technological Pedagogical Content Knowledge. It is based upon work by a guy by the name of Shulman. It looks at the interplay between content, pedagogy, and technology. How do good teachers manipulate pedagogy, content, and technology? Um, it is not a new idea. Well, it's, it's newish. It's been around now for about 10 years. It is a way of researchers looking at what, are, what is happening in classrooms. Do I think it's very practitioner-based? Not really. Um, I think when you do the, the assignment for it, you'll see where I'm coming from because there are aspects of it that you can then use to look around and say, are we really using technology here to do anything or are we just using technology? I mean, you know, it, it's not a stretch to say you're using technology in your classroom if you turn on a laptop that's projected onto a screen. Hey, that's technology. You know, that's not a stretch. If you move up that ladder and you start actually using the technology to do interesting things, that's how we're going to measure that through the use of something called TIM, Technology Integration Measurement. And TIM is very straightforward. It's very simple to understand. And it basically just looks at, okay, so what are we teaching? How are we using technology to do that teaching? Are we just using it as a substitution for paper or pencil? In other words, you're using a Word document or a Google Doc? Or are we doing something more interesting with it? Kids working collaboratively on a, on a Google Doc or a Word Doc. Lord help you if you have to do a Word Doc collaboratively. And then finally, Something that's very near and dear to my heart, Universal Design for Learning. Universal Design for Learning, I think, is the appropriate answer to this whole struggle that we have with trying to meet the multiple needs of students in our classrooms. I think that we have been kind of taken down... Um, a road that is so difficult to do, the teachers have given up on it. Um, this is reference into Towns Tomlinson's work about differentiated instruction. I think you know most teachers have, and I think it's a legitimate uh, expression. You know, they say, "I have 30 people in my room. How do you differentiate 30 people in a room?" I think it's a fair question. And so what happens is it just becomes cynical. And we don't really address the issue. UDL addresses the issue. Universal Design for Learning says this. There are multiple pathways in to the benefit of all. In other words, there's nothing wrong with the kid. There's something wrong with the curriculum that doesn't meet the kid's needs. And all we have to do is tweak that curriculum a little bit. And we can then have, someone's trying to call in. I want to make sure that everything is working right. Yep. We have the ability to reach all of our students' needs. Universal design for learning. It's good stuff. Really good stuff. You notice a trend here about the Padlets? <laughs> 
Here's where we'll land for probably about three classes. This is a Google Classroom. If you already a Google Classroom, yay, good for you. Uh, I'm trying to get the teacher certification for the Google Classroom off the ground here at the University of Louisville, try to make it a part of our BS students program so that they'll walk out the door being Google teacher certified. Um, if you already have a Google Classroom, great. Uh, I hope I don't bore you too much, but what I want to do is take us through all the different facets of the Google Classroom and what it could mean. And as you can see here, we um, look at Google Classroom, we look at Google Sites, um, and we try to get our heads around. I'm going to try to get my buddy, uh, my buddy, my student. <laughs> Carrie from up in Meade County to come in that night uh, virtually so we can have her give us a, her viewpoint of using her Google Classroom. And then we get to the digital native. This is Prinsky's work. And as you, as I kind of hinted at, I'm not, you know, as, as enamored with Prinsky as I used to be. But I do still think there's something here that we can talk about. Um, because we do have to realize that there is a difference now. There is a difference now. And one of the things that um, I've seen research on this, uh, looking at children, uh, young children, uh, preschool children, working with technology, is it's more an understanding of the affordances than it is the native... Uh, intelligence about using technology. By that I mean, you know what an affordance is. An affordance is something you use to do something else. To stop a car, you press on the brake. That's an affordance. For kids to start thinking out, outside of their understandings in concrete ways, in other words, thinking in terms of, here's a ball, I can hold it in my hands, bounce it up and down, and here's a picture of it. And then here's this thing we call ball. All this is part and parcel of being a human being. And technology fits into that very nicely. This is what I was talking about that Fullen talks about, being irresistibly engaging. We do this in two parts. We do the irresistibly engaging and assessment. So we look at a lot of tools that have to do with uh, developing things for kids <clears throat> that is engaging, that causes them to think outside of just regurgitation of facts. Um, and we have so many of those tools available to us now. Oh, my goodness gracious. And then we talk about the power of assessment to inform. Um, and again, we have so many tools. Just the simple tool that now is available inside a Google Classroom, the Google Forms tool, is just astounding. Uh, not to mention tools like Buncee and Nearpod, all these great tools that are available to us now that allow us to do things in multiple ways. You know, it's easy. It's so easy to create a multiple choice test in just about any tool online. But what about creating it so that the instruction has the multiple, uh, uh, has the, the test, the formative assessment built into it right away that you get immediate feedback right away you don't have to worry about grading and taking the papers home and all that. You get it right away. This is irresistibly engaging. Um, this is one of the, the main tenets of Fullman's work. And then we go off into the land of too cool. We're going to learn how to code. We're going to learn how to code using Scratch. Scratch is what's used in elementary schools. Why are we learning how to code, Steve? Very simple. One of the powerful things about kids learning to code is the understanding of failure and the understanding of how to plan and the understanding of problem solving and the understanding of product and the understanding of collaboration. I love Scratch. I love it to death um, because it's such an approachable way to teach coding. It is a visual coding. Um, it's actually called, well, it's visual coding because it uses these little blocks that you 
click together like little Legos. And then it runs, you can run the program. Uh, in other programs, you have to type in code. And there's some that are online. I'll actually show you a couple that are online. They do a nice job of helping kids see how to use that code. But I find that what if, if that's the point, then that's the point, right? I'm going to try to teach kids how to be coders. If what I'm really trying to teach kids is how to think critically and how to be creative in their creations in terms of what if we could do this? Um, I always find it interesting when I do this with kids, and I've done this with lots and lots of kids. Um, when you go in and you ask them and you say, so what do you want to do? We're going to learn how to code in the, over the next day or two or week. What do you want to do? And in, invariably, the majority of the room says, I want to, I want to make a game because that's their lens that they view this through. And they go, great. So what is a game? And they go, what do you mean? What is a game? What is a game? And they look at me and they go, what do you mean? I go, what is a game? And they go, uh, I say, is it just shoot them up? No, it's a story. So the first thing you have to do before you make a game is you've got to make a story. You have to come up with an idea that takes me on a journey, that takes me into a world that you want to create, that helps me see your viewpoint about something. Now, that sounds kind of highfalutin, and it is. But I mean, even if something as simple as a, as a Frogger game where you, you know, have the little character go across the road, you can change that up in so many different ways. And that's my point is I'm trying to get kids to realize that the ideas of this world are not set in stone. Um, one of the things that was first developed in the hacker community, and of course that has negative connotations now, but the original hacker community was, was a way for people to collaborate on ideas about technology and share. When I used to teach uh, Java programming, one of the things I would say to people is, okay, now that you know the nuts and bolts, creating code from scratch is a waste of your time because somebody's already done most of the work. So what you're going to learn is where are all these libraries that have all this code. And then you're going to utilize that code in creating your new stuff. Because now you can read it. That's the point. You can now read it. Just like when you were learning to write. And you would read stuff. And that reading influenced your writing. It's the same idea. And then we will launch off into the world of, oh my God, where are we now? Let's go do something in virtual reality. Let's create a virtual world that we can inhabit either through looking at it through the computer and walking around in it, or if you want to, you can put on your phone into a special pair of goggles, and I'll show you all this stuff. Um, obviously, you're not going to have use of the goggles, so we'll just have to rely upon using it um, or looking at it through our computers. But if you wanted to, putting on a pair of goggles where you can slot your phone into it, and then using the space that we'll be using called co-spaces, you can wander around inside of somebody's world that they've created. Now, um, I found this fascinating. My wife introduced me to a TV show that she started watching called Evil, which was fascinating in a lot of ways. Um, has one of my favorite guys in it who was um, Luke Cage on the Netflix series. But one of the things they introduce in this uh, show is these virtual goggles. The grandmother, who's kind of a uh, kook, brings these virtual goggles to the four girls who live with her mother, uh, with their mother. And they go into this world where these various spooky, creepy creatures exist. And I'm sitting there watching this, and I said to my wife, yeah, I did that last summer with a group of kids uh, in Summerbridge at U of L. And she just looked at me and she said, "You did what?" I said, "Yeah, you, you can use a program called CoSpaces, and you can create all these different monsters and all this different stuff." Now, I didn't go to the point where this was, which was trying to bring a demon into their house, but we would sit there and create these creepy sort of programs where you would be walking around inside of this world that they had created, and a zombie 
Dracula monster would pop out at you. And if they touched you, you were dead. Um, really <laughs> some interesting stuff. And when I see all that, I was sitting in a meeting yesterday where people were talking very uh, knowledgeably about, we're going to use a virtual reality to build a way for uh, kids to learn how to interface. Blah, 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 blah. And I said, now it'll probably cost us $50,000 for the equipment. Blah, 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 blah. I'm sitting there going, yeah, I could turn a bunch of kids loose in the summertime. They could build you that. And it doesn't cost a damn thing except for a subscription to the CoSpaces service, which I will gladly let you have. Uh, I have 30 seats. Uh, so, and that goes for anything we can play with. Uh, if you want to use it with your kids, hey, hey uh, please do. Uh, if you just want to play in it to kind of get your, you know, get your comfort level. Uh, one of the things about Nearpod is that it actually is a community of developers kind of around the idea of teachers pay teachers. Um, you have to go through a process where you get learn, you learn how to use the Nearpod and you, you basically create some Nearpod activities that you post to them and then they're, they're judged. And if they're deemed worthy, then they can be put into the Nearpod where you can actually make money off of people using it. Um, it's kind of interesting. And there's your final. Your final is nothing more than answering these five reflections. That's it. Not hard. Um, I will tell you that I am not um, interested in reading the great American novels. I'm interested in hearing your thoughts. I want to hear your thinking. I want you to be metacognitive. I want you to think about what we've done in class and how it has impacted you. Do you agree with it? Do you disagree with it? Please disagree if you want to. Um, and I want you to feel free to express yourself. We do focus in on a couple of things, like we talk about, you know, specifically the TPAC framework. And that's, that is my homage, my nod to the fact that we're a tier one research university. But really where I'm more interested in this hearing is, is thinking about you working with these digital natives and these resources and all that kind of stuff. Up here, I hope I'm not making anybody motion sickness. This is where your assignments live. Um, and this is where you will be putting stuff. And so as you can see, here's our first book study. And what we'll be doing is when you create something like here it is in the picture chart, all you're going to have to do is create something, capture the link that takes me to that creation, and you paste it in here. And as you can see up there, there's a link that will take you to the rubric for each one of these. Okay? And that's how we work. We'll use something called a blend space to demonstrate our understandings of TPAC, TIM, and UDL. Again, you'll basically just take the the URL that represents the work that you did in blend space, you paste it in here. So on and so on. Okay. Um, we're supposed to be using a tool called Folio Tech as opposed to Live Text. And I tried setting up the Folio Tech and I get an error. So I'm waiting on someone to tell me uh, what we're doing. <laughs> so don't worry. Don't worry. I'm your um guardian i guess you'd say uh your work is is most important to me and the thing about putting all your work here in blackboard is that blackboard is a direct connection over to the registrar which in other words is where your grade goes that is the genuine grade so um I'm very comfortable with this in here. As I learn what we're going to be doing with Folio Tech, it, it seems to me that what we'll end up doing with Folio Tech when they get it working is that we will be taking this document that's right here. It says EDAP 585 hat live text doc. It's just nothing more than a word doc. And then you'll be writing it within that and you'll be uploading it into the Folio Tech. And that is my understanding of how it's going to work. Um, and that's fine. You know, no problem whatsoever. Okay, uh, I'm done. I'm starting to lose my voice. You, know, you heard me kind of pause a couple of times to cough. 
as always, as always, I'll hear, you'll get sick of hearing me say this, but I truly, truly mean this, guys. If you have questions, if you have concerns, if you are lost, if you just need to have that time to get into my head to understand what we're doing, because do not mistake that I am not taking you on a journey. I am taking you gently by the hand, and I'm leading you down a path of thinking that has been put out there by some of the greatest minds that there is in instructional technology, and that is Michael Fullen, that is Kohler and Punya, uh, Harris, you know, all these people that you saw in the videos, uh, Sholekti, I'm taking you on a journey of understanding who they are and what they have to say so that you become a change agent for your building. When the building starts talking about, we're going to incorporate technology into the school. You can speak up and say, we need to have a conversation about what that's going to look like and what is the outcome. If all it is is a turn in capability. I remember when we first started doing this, we used a tool called Edmodo. It's still used in some places. And one of the things, and this is back when I was in, when I was a administrator in Jefferson County Public Schools. And one of the things we discovered right away was how much kids hated it. <laughs> and, you know, we thought it would be this wonderful, easy way for kids to turn in their digital documents and so on and so on. One of the things that I find really ironic is having been invited in to look at the digital backpack here in Jefferson County. What I see is pictures of kids' work. In other words, writing or photographs of that somebody took, usually it's a teacher, took a picture with their phone and they've uploaded it into the kids' Google Drive. And I just sit there and I smile to myself and I go, okay, how many millions of dollars are we spending? So we can take pictures of kids' handwriting and then put it into a Google Drive. Uh, that's not elegantly efficient, as Mike would say. Um, that's just kind of silly. So the point of this is I'm taking you on a journey. You can agree with me. You can disagree with me. That is your right. Um, but I think what we have to say through these different people you're going to be hearing from and reading about is that there is a message out, and it's not too late for us to get that message so that we can genuinely change education culture from being test-centered, what I call regurgitation-centered, give me the facts and let me spit them back at you, into a culture that two gentlemen by the name of Wiggins and McTeague, who if you stay in this program with me, you'll be hearing a lot more about as well, who have created something called Understanding by Design, where their belief is that all education is acquiring knowledge, understanding knowledge through demonstrations of understanding, and then transfer of knowledge into the world. And my goodness gracious, if technology doesn't meet those three criteria, I don't know what does. Okay, I'm done for the evening. Um, you know, you know how to reach me. Thanks everyone for being here. Those of you who will be watching this later, as I said early on, these recordings, um, I try to get them up every uh, evening after the class is over. So they're available either that evening or the next day. They will obviously be available for you whenever you need it on your time and in your space. The questions will always be asked of me. So how, uh, when do we have to turn things in? We will turn in the first few things together just to make sure we all understand how to do it. But then everything thereafter, is due when the class is done because all this is sitting here waiting for you thank you see you next uh thursday night